Well, hello there. My name is Don Tipping. I'm here at Seven Seeds Farm and Siskiyou Seeds, and I am going to share with you some insights on simplifying seed savings so you can incorporate it into your garden and your homestead in ways that help you grow your own seed, improve varieties that you're excited about, and um, have enough seed where you can share with your friends and neighbors and future gardens of yours. I'll also be looking at different ways in which uh, incorporating seed saving also enables you to have uh, residues and leftovers that you can feed to chickens and ducks and you know, on-farm livestock and also benefit pollinators because you're allowing plants to go to flower that normally wouldn't in some cases, like onions. So I hope you really get a lot out of this and um, I look forward to hearing tales of successful seed saving for each of you. Thanks. Saving seeds has been one of the foundations of agriculture and of human civilization. And in some ways, we can even say that saving seeds was a turning point in human civilization where we went from hunter-gatherers into um, farmers and gardeners and horticulturalists. And a lot of this came about due to observation of simple patterns in nature. We noticed when grasses had abundant seed that we could come along and gather for food. And we just noticed many other rhythms, whether they were visual or in time, or in the way animals moved, and in the cycles of the plants, when there would be abundant nut crops on acorns or this eat or what have you. And this pattern observation is still important to this day, and in, it's a critical aspect of seed saving because we peer deeper into the soul of the plant as we begin to try and understand its reproductive biology. So I want to start here at this place, this, this sort of wide-angle view on nature and on plants specifically, so we can connect back to the origins of agriculture and how observation led to noticing surpluses and seed saving is how we manage and save those surpluses so we can ensure the continuation of this started with native peoples around the world who would notice wild plants that would produce abundant seed crops and they would come and harvest them when they were ready. And this image is a pomo woman of the Northern California coast harvesting tarweed seed. In, in that instance, they'd actually use fire, but you can see how they have a special uh, basket and a beater, a woven beater for getting seeds in that basket for a high protein food. Well, this really isn't very different than grain. And it's something that for each of us goes back, way back in our ancestry, is the simple saving of seeds for planting later or to eat as a food. And I think it's worth pointing out that all of our grains that we eat, wheat, rice, corn, all the legumes, beans, peas, lentils, garbanzos, those are all seeds. Even things like acorns and almonds and walnuts, those are seeds as well. A seed can be defined as the fruit of any living plant. So the largest seed would be a coconut. And uh, obviously there's some very, very small seeds. In my experience, some of the smallest ones have been tobacco, fever few, things like that. Some of them are like dust. And over time, because this has been happening all over the world, we have this incredible diversity at our um, fingertips in this picture. The tomatoes just is a little snapshot into that. And some of this is visual, but it's also the adaptation to different climates and um, rainfall patterns and all of that. One estimation of rice varieties available before the Green Revolution in India 
came in at over 30,000 varieties, which is just simply astounding. And now there's about eight varieties cultivated throughout most of India. And we're in that pendulum swing place in human history where we're trying to bring biodiversity back and recognizing there are a lot of benefits from agrobiodiversity. And if this is a topic that is of interest to you, I encourage you to explore the work of Nikolai Vavlov, who started the world's first seed bank in Russia in the late 1800s and traveled all over the world gathering seeds of useful plants. And many of us are the beneficiaries of the work of people like this. And uh, maybe part of your calling is to participate in that yourself through saving your own seeds or being part of a seed library or local seed initiatives. A really important part of seed saving is to understand where you are. So here's, for me, this is where I am from the air. This is a picture of my farm about 15 years ago. And we are in the Pacific Northwest in a forested area. So it's really important to figure out your location. I think that plants adapt based by latitude. So we're at 42 degrees north latitude. So anywhere on the earth at 42 degrees north or south latitude is pretty much the same uh, sunlight patterns from winter through spring, summer, fall, and back around. And likewise, we're, let's say you're at 20 degrees latitude within the tropics, it's uh, going to be similar anywhere else in the tropics. So just the way the sun moves across the land is a really important aspect to understand because that's how plants experience it. So again, that understanding your bioregional location, this is Seven Seeds Farm is actually named after this, uh, this meadow on this mountain in the shape of a seven. And we bring a lot of people here to our farm and I try and explain that, you know, don't, don't always listen to why I do it or, you know, how exactly I do it. But look for the deeper patterns at work that can be more applicable to your garden and your life. And then you have something you can really work with because there are so much site-specific things uh, pertaining to growing plants, whether it's the soil, your rainfall, uh, how much sun you get, do you have shade, what type of pollinators or pests are prevalent, and so forth. So you got to get to know your, your ground. So within that, Commercially speaking, there are these significant seed growing regions and over time people have found that certain plants produce seed best in certain locations. This isn't to say that if you are not in one of these uh, areas uh, that I've identified here that you cannot save your own seed, you're just going to perhaps uh, have some more challenges that you wouldn't have uh, if you were for instance, in the West, where we have these dry summers that make uh, seed saving a lot easier than if you're getting summer rain. None, nonetheless, there are a lot of people that save seed where it does rain in the summer. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, over there in Virginia, there's the Seed Saver, uh, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, and they manage to produce seed of a lot of things. But I'll just go through this really quickly. The, Central Valley of California, the Willamette Valley of Oregon, and the Skagit Valley of Washington are some of the most significant seed growing regions in the entire world. So a lot of our vegetable seed is produced in those areas and the seeds that are sold in many of the catalogs that you use and may know and love are not grown where those companies are based. For instance, you know, there's a number of seed companies in New England but very little of that seed is grown there because it's not actually a very good place to grow seed on scale. Growing in your garden is one thing. You could be totally satisfied with a quarter to half the yield that you might get in a better area. Um, likewise, where we're at in southwestern Oregon, we are not in a good location for growing crops that want a cool summer. So there's those cool humid areas and crops like cabbage and cauliflower and spinach, uh, the china pods, like spinach uh, spinach and Swiss chard do really well there. Uh, in the hot humid states, any of the fruiting crops do really well. Um, you know, where you get rain in the summer, if you want the crops to be uh, dry for harvesting, you're going to be challenged by that. So here's another important distinction that we get into with seed saving and knowing your plant 
that you are going to be saving seed from. They're basically, you can kind of draw a line down the middle and certain vegetables are what we call wet seeded crops and other ones are dry seeded crops. So among the wet seeded crops are all the fruits you can see on this list, tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, melons, cucumbers, squash, gourd. All of those you're extracting the seed from a fleshy fruit. So it doesn't really matter if it's raining and then the way you process those seeds is a fermentation process and um, in, in that you're basically rotting away the flesh that you don't need and using water to uh, separate the seed from the, the pulp. That's contrasted with the dry seeded crops where you're allowing the crop to mature to the point where the seeds are, are dried and the stalks of the plant are usually brittle and dry. So lettuce, um, all the brassicas, broccoli, kale, collards, that kind of thing, onions and leek, corn, carrots, cilantro, and that include their relatives of celery, parsley, all your legumes, beans, and peas, and cheetah pods, beets, chard, and spinach. Those are all dry seeded crops. You're harvesting the seed when they're dry in the field. Then another important distinction to learn about is how is the plant pollinated? Is it pollinated by the wind or through insects? And as a general rule, if a plant has showy flowers, flowers that are really visible to you, obviously insects, then it's going to be an insect pollinated plant. So the wind pollinated plant are your corn and all the grasses like you know, wheat and barley and oats. And then the china pods, spinach, beets, and chard. Most of the vegetables that we use are insect pollinated. Cucurbits, which is all your cucumbers and squash and melons, the brassicas, the Apiaceae family, which is celery and carrots, parsnips, and so forth. All the aster family members, lettuce, eggplant, um, the Laminaceae's basil, and alliums. And yet another distinction. And this is all just from that backing up to where I was talking about pattern observation. These are simple patterns that you can observe, and it just helps you to get to know the plant a little better so you can save seeds successfully from it. There are plants that require two seasons to produce seed versus those that are annuals. So biennials are a little trickier. If you're new to this, I would suggest getting into doing the annuals first because they'll produce seed and one season, and often a fraction of that season, whereas the biennials, it, you have to overwinter the plant either in the ground or in storage somehow, and then go from there. So you can read through the list there and see who falls into each of those categories. And now I'm going to just dive into the, the main plant families and just outline some of the crops that we would be saving from seed and help you to understand how to avoid plants from cross-pollinating if you want to keep your seed to be true to type. So here is a good point to stop and explain that open pollinated varieties, they can cross with one another. So if we look here, for instance, with the brassicas, in the brassica oleraceae, broccoli, cabbage, collards, cauliflower, kohlrabi, the European kales like lacinato and Brussels sprouts are all in the genus Brassica and the species Oleraceae. Plants cross within species. Whereas if you look down this list, there's a number of other uh, genre that are Brassica, but they won't cross across that species barrier. So if you want to save seed from broccoli, you need to make sure there's none of the other Brassica Oleraceae flowering at the same time within about a quarter mile of where your broccoli plants are. So there's a, I won't dive into that level of detail for everything, but you can just see how in the Nebraska napus is Siberian kale and red Russian kale. So you can actually save seed from a lacinato kale and a red Russian kale in the same garden, and they won't cross because they're different species. The Nebraska rapa is turnips, Chinese cabbage, uh, the mild mustards, canola. Nebraska gentia is your spicy mustards, Rafina sativum is radish, and Yeruca sativa is so here we are looking at a Mitsuna seed crop, and you 
can see one flowering bolting there. That's a brassica. Uh, here's an observation. Here's a radish. This is another brassica. And they're what's called a weak annual. And you can actually get seed from radishes in one season because they do not require very much vernalization. Biennial crops require vernalization, meaning they need to experience a period of either shorter day length or cooler temperatures. So with radishes, we plant them early in the spring and they experience enough hours below 45 degrees Fahrenheit where they will flower in the first year. And there are exceptions to this. For instance, daikon radish is still the same species and they will cross-pollinate, but it is a strong biennial and needs to overwinter and experience fertilization. So here we are looking at a radish seed crop and uh, doing some selection. You don't always have to pull them up if you want to save seed, but we're doing plant breeding here and selection, so we're doing varietal and fruit. Uh, here's an example of once they're pulled up, there's you know, they pretty much all look about the same, but there is some variation in there. So if you want to do improvement, um, then you just replant the ones that you want. So doing this work, and this this is more advanced level, but I just wanted to show some images to give you a sense of, of where you can take this. And uh, here's an example of pink beauty radish stecklings. That's what they're called when you pull them out of the ground for replanting. And these got replanted the next day at another field. And that enabled us to pull out all the ones that were the wrong shape, color, uh, that bugs really ate a lot of the tops of, and so forth. Here's an example of what the radish plants look like after we've harvested the pods. They make a lot of biomass. You can see in this picture uh, that little radish turns into like a tumbleweed. You have to take it somewhere else for threshing, which is drive a tractor over on tarp to get the seeds out of the pot. Now the brassica is kale, and uh, kale is experiencing a major renaissance now with a lot of people including it in their cuisine, and that's great. So here's, this is another part of seed saving is a variety trial. You can see in this picture we have numerous different varieties of kale that we are growing to learn about the differences between the different varieties and to see we can do improvement. And even within a variety, there can be variation that you, as someone who's saving seed, can do something about. So in this picture, this is a Vates curly kale. And you can see a lot of variation in how green the plants are. Um, there's also variation in height um, and leaf shape and many other characteristics. So. If you want, if you're, every time you're saving seed is an opportunity to improve the variety uh, by only saving seed from the best plants. And that's how we got to where we are now and people have been able to domesticate the plants. So this is an ongoing process and in doing seed saving you have the wonderful opportunity to participate. This is an image of kale for seed when it's all done uh, maturing and we're harvesting the seed. See no leaves on the plants, they've grown tall, they're all done flowering, and they just have these brittle pods. So we clip those off into buckets or trash cans. So here's you know a variety I've been working on for some time to adapt a kale for our bioregion. Making some progress. Here's another uh, dry seeded crop is corn, and this started from a wild plant called Teosente tiny little kernels that are basically inedible. They're hard and they have a hard seed coat. Um, so you can see how through intention saving seed we've brought it to this point. Here's multicolored popcorn, here's our flower corn from the patch people. Lots of beautiful variation and not all variation is bad. Some of it gives us those opportunities to create new varieties. So in seed saving, to look a little bit deeper and learn about so many aspects of that, it's possible in the plant. Here's a variety that I bred out of some diversity called Sunfire. So here's another dry seeded crop. The plant family is called the Chinopodaceae. People might call it the Chinopods or the Goosefoot family, and that's what that means in Latin, basically. 
And in this family, we have a number of crops that are important to us. Beta vulgaris is both beets and swift chard. Spinacha oleraceae is spinach. Chinopodium quinoa is quinoa, a grain that many of you might be familiar with. And Atriplex hortensis, it's a wonderful Latin name, is auroch, which is a, a green that you can eat. And it's also used in the floral trade in seed pods. All of these are wind pollinated and um, can be grown as biennials or annuals. Here's an image of some Swiss chard. Swiss chard will let it grow uh, over the late summer and fall, over winter it, and then you know, here's an example of some breeding work the next spring, identifying what we're going to save seed from and you know, looking for the, the kind of characteristics that we want to see. And this is a, a multiple strain that we maintain. And when it flowers, it makes these stalks with seeds that are not in a pod but cling to the stem. So all, all the members of this family exhibit this trait. Spinach, the seeds aren't in a pod, they're, they're sort of stuck to the stalk. Quinoa is the same way. So we clip those and then dry them. Oftentimes we'll dry them in a greenhouse or a, a garage, but airflow is, is crucial. Um, and, and get those really brittle so that we can separate the seed from the stalks and the chaff. Another important family in the dry seeded crops is the Asteraceae. And in this uh, aster family is lettuce. Uh, the aster family is actually the largest plant family in North America, so there's many, many plants in that family. However, in terms of the vegetables that we might be familiar with, it includes chicory, Dikio and I have sunflowers, and by extension, that would be sunchoke as well, Jerusalem artichoke, burdock, and artichoke and cardoon, which actually will cross with one another. And many of the flowers that you grow in your garden, uh, calendula, marigold, and sinia, these are all in the aster family. Some of the asters, like lettuce, are self pollinated, but many of them are more promiscuous, meaning they will cross pollinate more readily. So you need to keep them isolated. For instance, if you want to grow a sunflower or a zinnia for seed in your garden you, and you want it to breed true to type, then you need to make sure that it's grown in isolation from other plants of that species. In terms of the distance that you need, there are rules and there's a lot of that information available online. But what I'd like to share with you is, again, learning your site. We have a 40-acre farm here with three fields separated by forest and a creek, and I've found that I can maintain those different fields as different isolations. So normally with a sunflower, you might need a quarter to a half mile of isolation, but I found based on the wind patterns that are predominant here and these forested uh, strips between my fields that I can actually grow seed of multiple varieties. So. I encourage you to play around, check it out, and if something crosses up a little bit, it's no harm done, really. You're just getting a, something new that maybe hasn't happened in nature before. Here's lettuce, growing it for seed. You basically just let it um, keep growing, and it'll bolt and mature. And when it's done flowering, the seeds will be there. Here's a little trial uh, that we did to learn more about the varieties of lettuce that are there. We grew lettuce for other seed companies for many years, so let all this go to seed. And when we'd have that, we'd look out for these, uh, what you call the rogues, uh, the plants that were off types. And how they got in there, who knows, but uh, our goal to keep the variety true type is to take them out. So here's one of my kids when they are much littler, helping with that important plant breeding effort. Another dry seeded crop, uh, this is actually an APACA, is uh, parsley. This just gives you an idea of some of the scale that you can do this on. These are thousand foot beds and you let these go to seed. This is at a neighboring farmer's farm. There's uh, peppers. Are, these are a, a wet seeded crop, but they're an annual seed producer. Peppers are generally what are known as pollinated. And uh, But if a hot pepper crosses with a sweet pepper, it can be really unfortunate. So we keep our hot pepper seed crops separate from our sweet pepper seed crops. 
a little bit of hot crossing into another hot pepper is not that big a deal. Likewise, a little bit of sweet crossing into a sweet, but you're getting bell peppers that are spicy. Nobody wants that, I don't think. This is parsnips. Uh, they're in the APACA plant family. And here we are dig up for replanting. And then we replant these roots. Uh, these were probably dug up in February, but grown the previous day. And then you can see that tall kind of yellow colored uh, hedge there. That's parsnips gone to seed. They grow to be these huge plants. So the alliums is, or the alliaceae, includes the onions, the leeks, garlic, bunching onions, and shallots. So uh, these are generally biennials. So when you're growing it as a seed crop, you grow onion bulbs, like so, and you get to this point, you select them and say, okay, that's what it and then we actually put them back in the ground. So this is a whole bunch of bulbs put back in the ground, and this is in the spring, and they've been allowed to grow a little bit, and they'll keep growing and then flower and then make seed in that year. Here we are planting out bunching onions uh, after we've selected them as a seed crop for the, you know, the next growing cycle. Here's what onions look like as they're just starting to flower. You can see those immature flower buds that John Navazio is pointing out there. And here they are at maturity, and they make these funny pom-poms. And then the seed is this black seed, and this is just showing one of the seed cleaning steps. We actually submerge the chaff in water to separate the seeds. So another important plant family, very important one, in fact, is the cucurbitaceae. This includes all the fine crops like uh, your summer squashes, uh, your winter squash, melons, and watermelons and cucumbers. So you can see within this is where you really got to learn your genus and species because there's some surprises here. The cucurbita, once again, is the genus. Pipo is the species. Within that species, all of these varieties will cross. So. All your summer squash, zucchini, acorn squash, delicatas, pumpkins, and ornamental gourds will all cross-pollinate with one another. And to make matters worse, in terms of trying to really make seed saving easy with the cucurbits, they have very showy flowers that bugs, uh, pollinators, love to visit. So to grow pumpkins out for seed, you need to make sure there's no zucchini or delicata or crooknecks uh, growing within a quarter mile. And one way you can get around this is hand pollination. And the next slide will show an image of that. Uh, the, but here's here's one where it will get a little easier for you. Cucurbita maxima is a different species. They will not cross-pollinate with the pipo uh, species. So that includes your buttercups, kabocha, the hubbards, some of the giant pumpkins like the Dills Atlantic Giant and Red Curry types. So you can grow a zucchini for seed in your garden, a buttercup squash, and you can see the next species down is the cucurbita machata, and that's your butternut squash. So you can grow one member from each of those in your garden, and they won't cross, and you can save seed from each of them. So garden planting takes on a whole new meaning when you want to save seed. And here's another little uh, kind of sneaky one is Armenian cucumber. You'll see that's listed down under Cucumus milo. That will cross-pollinate with cantaloupes and muskmelons and honeydew. It's actually an immature melon. So you could grow a cantaloupe and a normal cucumber, Cucumus sativus, in the same garden, and they will not cross. But you could not grow a normal cucumber, like a you know sweet market more, with an uh, uh, with a you know Armenian cucumber. They won't cross, but you can't. You know, you got to observe these species lines. It's basically what So here we are. We're doing a hand pollination project on this winter squash to improve it. So uh, squash and the whole cucurbit family is interesting in that it has male flowers and female flowers on the same plant. So they're what are called imperfect flowers. So what is shown here is a male flower has been broken off and is being used to pollinate a female that was taped shut the day before, so no other pollen got in there. And right after this pollination, that blossom got taped shut with some masking tape, labeled really well, and then when that fruit developed, 
we knew that the seed inside of it would have come from uh, the same same plane. So the beauty of doing this is you can make something with squash blossoms in your kitchen later too. And so this is that project we're working on with that hand pollination. This is called Sun Dream winter squash and we are stabilizing what started off as a hybrid to grow an open pollinated variety. And as an aside, another aspect of doing plant breeding is these uh, orange winter squash. We then stored them over the winter and we only save seed from the ones that held up well in storage. So we we're selecting for storage quality in addition to other traits. Here's some yellow crookneck squash, uh, just showing how we'll smash them up to get the seeds out. The winter squash and the cucumbers, we'll just cut them in half and scoop the seeds out and ferment that. And uh, you can check out, I've got uh, you know, videos on wet processing on our YouTube channel, but it's a little too lengthy to go into right now. Um, our seed cleaning, to just take it forward a little bit, is pretty simple. We just use a, a fan and these tubs for most of it, and that process is called winnowing. So screening and winnowing are how we clean most seeds uh, once they're dry. Now, here's an image of some of the hand screens we have and a little bit larger screen. You really don't need fancy equipment. Although if you can manage to find something like this, we picked this up as a bit of an antique. Uh, it's from the 1960s. It's a three screen cleaner that winnows. But even still, I, I think the hand screens and winnowing does just as good a job. Here's an image of the wet processing uh, there where we fermented tomatoes in these buckets and we're pouring off the slop and you keep adding more water and the seed settles to the bottom and the, the pulp floats and eventually you'll wind up with just water. You repeat that process and you wind up with water and seeds. Pour that seed onto a screen and dry it and, and you have your seed. See the ducks like this process. And here uh, is a, a machine that does the same thing basically because we used to do a lot of this. And one of the beauties of doing seed saving is that you have this byproduct in the weirberry. You can see tomato pulp and pepper pulp. And we'll bring that to our chickens and they think it's pretty neat. And um, the yolks, when we've done this with hot peppers when we've grown for seed, it's incredible to see how neon orange the yolks get when they do this. And, uh, apparently birds don't have taste buds, so they don't mind hot peppers. Here's cucumbers for seed. When we eat a cucumber, they are an immature uh, stage of their development. When you let them mature, which you have to do for seed, similar to eggplant, we eat eggplant when it's immature. So these are uh, what would normally be a green market more cucumber, and they've sat out in the field and ballooned up to these big things and we'll cut those open and scoop out the seeds and ferment it and separate it that way. Here's just a couple different uh, glimpses of seed saving. Uh, on the one side of the image you can see the, the brilliant yellow canary yellow zinnia uh, maturing for seed and then the other side is lettuce for seed. And you can see how it doesn't look like heads of lettuce at all but it's flowered and that white fluff is kind of like dandelion fluff because they're actually related. So again, back to that observation piece, as you begin to save seed, you will begin to really learn from your own firsthand experience which plants are related to one another. And here's doing some selection on sweet corn. When you grow sweet corn for seed, you have to let it mature all the way in the field and let it dry down and the kernels get all wrinkled up. Uh, if you were to try and you know, harvest a fresh ear in the milk stage, it would not, um, the seed wouldn't be mature enough. And once again, what, participating in the cycle of life in this way is really one of the most miraculous things I've experienced. I feel really grateful to be doing this work. And I am really hopeful that you, know, you find a way uh, in your life to include seed saving in a, a meaningful way. And, the beauty of what I see with this, and I, I was kind of chuckling to myself as I thought about it, is we sell seeds through a small seed company called Siskiyou Seeds uh, that's based from our home farm here, our family farm. And we've been doing that for a lot of years. 
we have a number of seed racks around uh, our general bioregion within 100 miles of our farm. And as I was setting up one of those seed racks, it was in a natural food store, I, it sort of hit me like, well, if they were to really figure out what I'm doing here, they probably wouldn't let me do it because they've let me bring in my own homemade wooden seed racks, put seeds on there of many of the crops that they sell for food in that store, that their very business depends on them selling to stay in business. And here I'm allowed to sell, they not only allow me, they pay me to do it, seeds of food. So people can go grow their own food, and if they learn how to save seed, then they can even cut me out of the picture. And then they won't need to come back to this store. And the more I think about the way gardening fits into my life is clean air and clean water and clean food, I think are the three most important elements of health and through doing seed saving you're you're just you're closing one more loop in that cycle and uh and feeling more empowered too and then another cool feed loop that i see and i think this image really depicts as well is you know a lot of us uh, i think of those uh things i listed the clean air clean water and clean food we also need beauty and we need love. And when you're saving your own seeds, you get to interact with the, the life forms that you're saving seeds from, these plants. And you get to decide, like, oh, I really like this shade of pink and these cosmos, or I want my cucumbers to be shaped like this, or maybe if I taste a fruit from this cucumber plant and it's bitter and I and I pull out that plant or don't save seeds from that plant, whereas the one next to it, every fruit is sweet and I only save seed from that, I can help this variety evolve to the point where it's going to uh, be a sweet fruited uh, strain more and more. And that agency that we gain through doing seed saving is not to be underestimated. And um, I'm sorry if you're a little dizzy from all of the technical terms and the Latin names and all the peculiarities, but figure out one crop that you want to save seed from. Take an easy one, like lettuce. Lettuce, it, it's self-pollinated. You could save seed from one plant, and then you, you would be successful. And that one plant can make up to an ounce of lettuce seed. And there's almost 30,000 seeds in an ounce of lettuce seed from one plant. And that factor of multiplication is just miraculous. And gardening is a miracle in and of itself when you, you know, amidst all of the, the challenges of the weather and the pests and gophers and our own neglect and that kind of stuff. But then you take it to a whole other order of magnitude with seed saving. And, and that's just amazing to me. And, and that's, I'm really excited to see more and more people get involved in that. And again, just start simple and you'll harvest small mistakes. There's the saying goes, start small, harvest small mistakes. You start big and say, I'm going to save the seed from everything in my garden, and you're going to wind up with a bunch of really crossed up, uh, cross-pollinated things that won't really be all that useful. Because think about uh, like a, a pumpkin and a zucchini crossing. You, you don't necessarily get the best of both worlds. You kind of get something that isn't very good at being a pumpkin or very good at being a zucchini. So that's why that, that role of the gardener, the horticulturalist, is really important and I think shows up in a really significant way with seed saving because we are intervening in a working with nature uh, fashion. You have to work with nature in order to have seed saving be successful because you rely on reproductive biology and oftentimes pollinators, needless to say, the life cycle of the plant being able to take it to mature seed. There's just no shortcuts. And uh, in doing so, we're uh, helping influence the kind of reality we're going to have in the future. And I know I'm a father, and that's something that's of, of deep importance to me, is to help create a world that is going to be better than when I found it. And I think there's few things, uh, like seed saving, that actually empower us to be a part of it. And, you know, and I see that when I go to the farmer's market, we still do some produce at the farmer's market. And 
and I see people getting their food there and they're attracted to the color and the beauty and the aroma and oftentimes it's the, the moms that are there at the market with their kids and they're deciding what's going to wind up on the plate and you know, so I want to encourage each of you to figure out one plant that you're going to save for seed like lettuce or basil pick something easy if you need a resource beyond this uh, this little talk here I would steer you to a book called Seed to Seed by Suzanne Ashworth and it covers all those basics because you'll you'll really want that as a reference book until you memorize all these things which eventually if you stick with this you will and, um, so I'll leave you with just a couple resources we do have a seed company we sell seed called Siskiyou Seeds Seven Seeds Farm is the name of our farm we teach a five-day intensive on seed saving on farm twice a year that's a five-day training called the seed academy the next one's coming up in may and we'll be doing it again in october the organic seed alliance their website is there seed alliance has excellent resources on um, kind of taking all this to the next level if you want to try and earn a living growing seeds and do plant breeding uh, the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance, their website is there, teach seed schools around the country. Uh, I believe there's one coming up this summer in Vermont. And they have a lot of excellent resources on seed libraries and uh, teaching about seeds. And then the Seed Savers Exchange, seedsavers.org, maintains the Seed Savers Yearbook, which is all available open pollinated vegetable varieties in the country, and a network for sharing seeds with other people that are enthusiastic about this. So thank you very much for your time. Again, my name is Don Tipping here at Siskiyou Seeds, and I wish all of the best to, to you and your families and your gardens. Thank you.